Hello and welcome back to another episode of Nick Tiffany's Movie Reviews, coming at you online and in print format at nicktiffany.com, in audio format wherever you get your podcasts, and even in video on YouTube. You might be tuning in now on our live stream. Little little way to get a sneak peek before the episodes actually come out. I'm playing a little bit of catch up this week. Uh, you know, we'll have two episodes kind of back to back. There's been a lot in the week or so I took off doing a little vacation. Uh, lots come out, both theatrically and on streaming, VOD and rental. Tons that I'm really looking forward to talking about. Tons that it was great to kind of catch up and play a little catch up on. Uh, I really kind of want to get into the meat, at least for this episode. I, I, I'm going to chunk it up kind of week by week, just in terms of what you may have seen last week, what I would have seen last week. First, what did I just see this weekend? Trying to catch up to getting these a little bit closer to that release weekend, whether it's a new Friday movie and getting you that review on Saturday. So bear with me. We're <laughs> we're going to clean that up a little bit. But I want to just jump right in and talk about probably the biggest theatrical release of the last two weeks. And that's Fede Alvarez's Alien Romulus, a kind of pseudo sequel to everything that Ridley Scott had been kind of cooking up, whether it was with Prometheus, Alien Covenant, all the way back to his original Alien. Uh, Fede Alvarez, great horror director, uh, has a tendency to be a little bit brutal in some of his horror, uh, whether you've seen Don't Breathe or perhaps his Evil Dead remake. Uh, just some wild gore or wild, like, unspeakable, horrific acts or certain things that are happening. Um, and he, you know, really does a great job of evoking a great sense of fear and disgust and just, like, does a really good job creating disturbing imagery. And so when I heard he signed on to direct the next Alien film after Neil Blomkamp, who'd kind of done District 9, he was in line to do an Alien film at least for a little while, but that fizzled out. Uh, so really it's nice that they're making another alien film. Covenant was the last, uh, the last one I can remember seeing in theaters. Uh, so this one doesn't necessarily follow that trilogy that Ridley Scott was sort of setting up, but Alvarez does a great job kind of giving a nod to all the different films in the series, finding a way to kind of connect all the different cohesive works uh, whether it's those little moments in Prometheus and Covenant, what David was trying to figure out is going on with these goo, these engineers, how they kind of weaponized some of this stuff, even going all the way back to the first original Alien and this idea of fossilized uh, face huggers, all sorts of just really unsettling stuff. Uh, so weirdly, I was kind of nervous going into this movie. I feel like every time I go into an Alien movie, I'm always a little nervous. Horror. I'm always, I enjoy, I hate being scared, but there is that thrill of like, oh my God, like Jesus, that was a great jump scare. But you know, my heart rate is above 150 for sure. So going into this alien movie, I was like, I know there's just going to be some screwed up stuff that happens. And Alien Covenant was pretty brutal. Like watching that and Prometheus and some of the other alien films, you know, they just progressively get better with their effects. And because of that, you get more grotesque and horrifying deaths. So it's no shocker that by the time we've got chest bursting and all sorts of stuff happening in Romulus, it looks horrifying. More so than ever, it looks more realistic. It sounds bones breaking more than ever. It is so unsettling, but it is so effective. And, you know, talking with my dad after watching this movie, he kind of likened it to what J.J. Abrams kind of did with Star Wars The Force Awakens. And I definitely agree in the sense that he's kind of rehashing some of the similar beats of the original Alien movie. There's definitely a lot of homage played there. He certainly twists some things around. Uh, there's definitely moments towards the end that might evoke a little bit of James Cameron's Aliens, uh, where you get a little bit more of the let's kick ass and take some names against these xenomorphs. Uh, but... By and large, he definitely is trying to tell a different story here while still keeping in line with all the legacy Alien films that have come before it. Uh, Kaylee Spaney, who is just on a hot streak after Civil War and Priscilla, kind of leads the show here as Rain. Uh, she and David Johnson, who plays her android brother, uh, Andy, appropriately named, the two of them are working in a mining colony for the Wayland yutoni Corporation. From the beginning, the the way this mining colony is set up, just visually this movie is so striking. 
after playing games like Starfield recently and seeing the possibility not only for 4K graphics and whatever people are able to create with CGI, you know, they're effectively creating different off-world planets that look normal and they look possible enough in terms of the technology they're using, the vehicles, the ships, everything feels within the realm of possibility for what we could build now. Um, but you get this great sense of how just depressing and awful the Wayland Utoni Corporation is, and you see the conditions people are working in. So it's no wonder why this group of five or six kind of younger uh, ragtag miners there say, we want to get out of here. You know, if we can get out of orbit, there's a ship that we can get to and we can get far away from this place because let's face it, you know, they're just going to keep putting us to work. Anytime someone's eligible for transfer, oh, mysteriously, you know, we need more work from people. They immediately do a great job kind of setting the tone for why this group of people would want to leave, especially the fact that they are young with their lives ahead of them. You don't want to die like your parents did in the mines. You don't want to have to worry about living a short life with lung cancer, all sorts of new diseases. So the motivation is very clear from the beginning, which is great, but it can also be quite blinding, um, especially in an alien horror movie. You know, anytime people start getting cocky, you just got to slow your roll a little bit. So I, uh, I really appreciated just some of the setup as far as what their stakes were, what the living conditions are. And some of these shots out in space are just exceptional. Um, really playing on that, obviously, in space, no one can hear you scream. There's moments with absolutely zero sound where, you know, I can hear my own breath and I'm kind of gripping the chair. I'm like, okay, what's going to happen? It's not going to be some nice Star Destroyer flying overhead. It's not that easy. Uh, but they play so well with the tension in this film. I don't want to go too deep into kind of exploring what happens once they get up to that ship, but I'm sure you could fill in some of the blanks. There's definitely some alien activity, some really inventive and creative sci-fi moments uh, that sort of play around with whether it's physiology or some of your body composition and how you can sort of maybe evade some of these creatures or, you know, thinking back to how you can cloak yourself against a predator, covering yourself in the mud. There's some really creative ways that they sort of tackle certain situations in this film. And maybe again, because they are all younger actors, most of them, I would say relatively unknown. Uh, there is this energy to their performances that is either like the, Oh my God, we've got to get out of here. You know, Bill Paul, the game over, man. It's not that cheesy necessarily or funny, but there's this urgency. There's this selfishness that comes with being young and feeling like, oh my God, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I've got to do what's best for me. And of course, what's best for you probably isn't best for the group. But man, there are some lethal, lethal kills in this movie. Some that are just horrifying and become more horrifying. Truthfully for Fede Alvarez, I'm not going to lie. I was expecting something that might top either the spinal break from Alien Covenant or the Prometheus kind of cesarean operation there. There are moments that, you know, you see a lot of blood or you see certain things that I was like, I bet we're going to go. I bet the camera's going to switch up a view here. And it didn't, which again, I'm, I'm not saying I'm like glad that we didn't get that. I'm like, I'm, I'm happy with what we got. I'm glad I wasn't throwing up into a popcorn bucket like some people might have claimed that they were doing. You know, there's nothing I don't think that is like so egregious or like so awful to watch. There's just a lot of just really unsettling stuff and like moments like toe curling, like, oh, and uh, you know, the back half of the film just goes somewhere. I was not expecting uh, super creepy, super odd. Just I've seen so many posts of people <laughs> like the last 20 minutes of the movie. It's like, what the, what is happening? What am I looking at? I I liked Alien Romulus. I had a I had a pretty good time with it. I still think that, you know, for me, it probably falls behind the I don't know. Alien and Aliens are so classic in their own right. I'm a huge James Cameron fan, so that action commando heavy aliens uh is just tons of fun. Um and I've got certain memories watching that with different groups of people that are, are hard to shake. Prometheus for me has always kind of stuck out as one of the first films that really I kind of did the deep dive, whether it was on Reddit or fan theories and just trying to piece together the mythology of the world that Ridley Scott has been creating. 
across these different films, whether it was different directors. Um, so I don't know. Prometheus is just probably my own personal number one, because I remember staying up hours with two of my best friends at the time. Just, okay, I think if this happened here, then this was mutated because of this. And we can link that back to the first alien because it was just, it's those cool movie moments where you come out of something and you're like, I can't shut up and stop talking about this because how does this link to that now? Did you catch this moment? Alien Romulus is definitely full of a lot of that. So it does fall probably for me somewhere closer to four or five, but I think there are so many solid alien movies that we have that even being at four or five is just a testament to how incredible the lore and this mythology is that uh, ultimately Ridley Scott has kind of created. So I, I hope, you know, the film was shot for $80 million. It's cleared $220 million worldwide already, uh, so which is huge, both for, you know, rated R films, for horror, for the sci-fi genre, for something that felt like it was in limbo for a while, kind of like I'd mentioned with Neil Blomkamp. So there's going to be an alien earth TV series coming to FX, which supposedly takes place three decades before the original alien movie. So I got to got to start piecing together my timeline and figuring out what happens where and how this is going to affect things, because it seems like it's a little too early for a xenomorph, but I don't know. What do I know? We always rewrite the rules these days. So alien Romulus though, definitely worth the time. I wish I would have seen it in IMAX. It wasn't shot for it. I ended up going in Dolby, you know, so that was definitely not a waste. The sound design in the film is immaculate. And horror, as my dad also says, is just like 90% sound. And he's not totally wrong. You know, there's just moments where you're like, oh, my, that violin, that well-paced, <laughs> that's enough to send me over the edge. So come watch a horror movie with me and you'll see it's probably more entertaining to watch me than the actual movie. But Alien Romulus, go see that in theaters if you can. It was just awesome. And David Johnson and Kaylee Spaney are terrific I hope, obviously, we're going to see a lot more of Kaylee Spaney in the, the world of Hollywood. David Johnson totally came out of left park for me and just, he was awesome. He really carried himself well, plays the android role uh, to a T, but adds some new flair to it. Was able to switch up directives and things really well. Uh, just very, very impressed with him in this film. And again, so much new, cool science that they kind of bring into it or ways to kind of showcase horrible deaths that are also like oh but it serves a different purpose but we'll we'll switch gears a little bit and now we'll kind of move to the streaming side of things doug lyman a man who i'm sure many people are familiar with you might know him from american made with tom cruise edge of tomorrow with tom cruise jumper mr and mrs smith uh you know more recently he's kind of I don't want to say regressed. I don't, you know, the whole streaming change in the world has certainly changed a lot of what films look like, I feel, and how different artists and people tackle them, whether it's new restrictions, whether it's trying to reach a certain budget because we know it's not going to the big screen and working with those limitations. So earlier this year, Doug Lyman directed Roadhouse, Jake Gyllenhaal, Conor McGregor. Uh, and again, I didn't see the first original Roadhouse you know, I've heard I'm not necessarily, maybe if you've watched the Family Guy sketch, you know, I'm just sure it was a lot of people getting kicked around, you know? It's just bar fighting. It is what it is. Nobody puts baby in the corner. Maybe that's something else. But, uh, but Roadhouse, I mean, it just, I don't know. I watched it. It was fine. Shot really interestingly. Some of the frame rate stuff was odd. The fighting wasn't bad, but you know, kind of felt like a waste of a Jake Gyllenhaal role for all the talent that he possesses. I was just kind of left wanting more. It doesn't really offer anybody much more than just mindless violence and popcorn action, which is fine. But for a director who's clearly capable of making stuff with a little more depth, I was hoping for a bit more from that. So I come to find out on Amazon, on Apple this time, Apple TV, a film called The Instigators, starring Matt Damon and Casey Affleck. You know, his, uh, his little brother, so to speak. And this is a heist film, comedy. Hong Chao is also in the film as a, as a therapist who kind of gets involved in some things. But, you know, Matt Damon, he's divorced. You know, he doesn't get to see his son. He doesn't really have too much motivation to go on in his life, unfortunately. And he's offered a job 
so he can make the money essentially that'll kind of set things right maybe so that he could be better in his son's eyes and then you got Casey Affleck plays Cobby a, a prior inmate at one point trying to maybe get back on the straight and narrow but you know our opening scene is having some kid breathalyze for him so he can start up his bicycle uh which just I feel like immediately this film is just drenched in the east coast in that boston area just from people's general attitudes to the comedy to the accents i mean just i mean immediately for matt damon and casey affleck it felt like home it felt like the slice of like all right i don't totally know what my expectations are for this apple tv original comedy movie but when they're talking about comedy and they're talking about what the hell you were doing down there and you know the boston accent starts coming out and they're giving each other shit while they're trying to learn what the plan is, it just, uh, you know, these guys don't miss a beat. And there's just something so familiar about Matt Damon and Casey Affleck that I'm not saying you're willing to overlook some of the glaring pop plot holes or some of the glaring inadequacies maybe of the script, uh, but it's entertaining. I laughed a, a pretty great deal watching this film. Um, I guess I didn't take it maybe as seriously as Roadhouse. Once I know that this was also another streaming release from Lyman, I was like, okay, I might temper my expectations a little bit. Uh, and perhaps because of that, I, I had a great time. I laughed, you know, Alfred Molina and Michael Stolberg are in this film briefly kind of doing a little bit of a Boston deal, you know, kind of setting up this background gangster mob deal. Ron Perlman's in the film. Jack Harlow's got a little bit part, which to his credit, Actually, you know, he, he held his own acting with Casey and Matt. And I kind of watched a little blurb of the two of them talking because this would be a film where watching the interviews for it is just as entertaining as watching the movie because Matt Damon and Casey Affleck just, I mean, it's effortless. It is. It's like this is, you know, his little brother, obviously. Ben Affleck, the older brother there. But, you know, you can just tell there's so much history there. The humor is effortless. It feels... I don't want to say more genuine than some other films, even though they're reading lines or even though it's coming from the script, you know, I'm sure they're doing some improvisation and they just know how to play off of one another so effectively that it just, you can't help but laugh. So I don't, you know, the instigators, is there some good action? Not really. I mean, it's fine. It, you know, it's, it's not going to do anything for you on that front. I would say, but I would say more than anything, if you were a fan of Matt Damon and Casey Affleck, if you're a fan of that East Coast humor, if you're not looking for something that's too serious, too dramatic, mopey, whatever it is, if you just need something to like, hey, that was pretty fun, actually. Those guys are pretty funny. You know, it's not going to be anything on the Will Ferrell level where you're watching it again and again and again. But if you need something new, I, I'm always down for a new Hong Chao movie as well. Her bit part in the film is quite funny. Uh, she's just got a precision to her acting that I, she can work across anyone and just effectively tear them down so well. I just love to see it. Anybody who's watched the menu especially knows what I'm talking about. But the instigators, for what it is, I had a better time with it than I had with Roadhouse. Better movie, better actors, better ingredients, Papa John's. That's, you know, it's it's not the, the take and bake level of Papa Murphy's, but that's for what it is, I enjoyed it watching it and having some wine, you know? And that's all you can ask for sometimes. Then I kind of switched gears to watch another film on rental right now of the animated variety. But one of my favorite stories, graphic novels, film adaptations, as far as comic books go especially, and that's Watchmen. DC, Warner Brothers Animation are, you know, they've gone through Crisis on Infinite Earths kind of doing a three-part film animated series, blending their animated universe with their newer Tomorrow universe they've been doing, trying to appease fans of all sorts, really not hitting the mark on any of those films, really. They just kind of progressively got worse, unfortunately. Um, and they just felt like there was so much missed opportunity for the voice talent that they did acquire for it, for the stories they could have told. Uh, so to learn that they were making Watchmen Chapter 1 and 2, it was like, okay, all right, you know, do we, and I don't know, maybe this is the way my mind works. We have a three hour, three hour plus, if you want the, the, uh, the comic book voyage portion in the live action movie to go along with it. If you want the most authentic version of the Watchmen graphic novel 
it exists nearly frame for frame uh, by Zack Snyder. And again, I'm, you know, I'm trying to, you guys know I'm a Zack Snyder fan. Watchmen predates so much of his other work that drew me in, especially for the Justice League and all that other stuff. Uh, before all that, there was 300 and there was Watchmen, two films that just totally different, especially Watchmen, though. I was obsessed with this film in high school. Uh, my friend Jesse and I, I remember we watched it and it was just such an interesting deconstruction of superheroes, tells a darker, grittier story, uh, really fascinating characters just across the board. Rorschach, of course, kind of becoming a, a fan favorite, maybe shouldn't be necessarily the fan favorite, but you know, you've got Dr. Metropolis, uh, Dr. Manhattan, um, Captain Metropolis is also in this movie, but you've got Dr. Manhattan who I feel like in the film version, it is so hard to top everything that was done there. It just, I don't know, in handling so much of the character of Dr. Manhattan, having multiple hours to kind of dedicate to that character and stripping away Okay, the fact you're not, you are maybe human, but you can look into the future. You've seen the future. You've lived the past and you're experiencing all of these things at once. So I don't know. I, I thought Zack Snyder did such an effective job as a fan of the graphic novel. I thought he did such an effective job telling that story. There are a few minor things that they switched up, whether it's the, the giant squid at the end. I know some people weren't happy with that because it does stray a little bit from the the actual graphic novel but i know that what Zack snyder was going for it's hey if you've got mainstream audiences who have literally never read this graphic novel and we throw this giant squid at the end of this people are going to be like what the f what is this that's just ruined a pretty great movie you know or a pretty great story and so i like what they did in terms of weaponizing dr manhattan dr manhattan's energy um nuking multiple parts of the world and kind of bringing them together against him you know adrian veidt you know kind of creating this united enemy that the world could come together against uh, so i don't know i for what the film version does i feel like it'd be really hard to watch an animated version that's more satisfying so part one or chapter one is out i watched it the other night with my best friend it's an hour and 20 minutes which Maybe part two is going to be closer to two hours. I don't know. But uh, it was breezy. It it just, I don't know. There are so many beats where it's like, okay, yeah, this is the comic. This is the movie. You know, we've seen this, but now it's just an animated form. And yes, there's a couple extra little scenes they add or the way that they kind of cut back to homages or different memories that some of the characters have. Other than that, there's really not that much is different from the film version. And what really stood out to me was just like, wow, I almost wish you would have gotten some of the voice actors from the film to do this because it's hard listening to someone else try to play Dr. Manhattan. Uh, Katie Sackhoff is in the film and she does do a, a pretty great job as uh, Laurie at one point. But I don't know, by and large, from the comedian to... I'm like, I don't know. I just, it was fine. The animation style wasn't bad. Um, you know, I think some of the DC and Warner Brothers animated films can range from decent animation to just kind of trying to do strange new things, playing around with two dimensionals again. Um, I don't know. Uh, this really didn't do much for me as a fan of Watchmen. It was like, okay, cool. It was nice to see that little scene, that 30 second bit included there. I think the bulk of what is going to be different from this Watchmen story and Zack Snyder's is going to be that ending and how they tell it in the chapter two. But, uh, you know, it's not even September and chapter two doesn't come out until 2025. So it just feels like this odd, like, all right, that was a hour and 20 minutes. Now I got to wait months for chapter two. I just need the release schedule of it all. And you can only rent it and buy it online. Um, uh, you know, the, the access to it is not the easiest. So more than anything, it just, for me, points out so many holes that DC's animation has, just in terms of its release, getting it out there, whether you get it on HBO Max, Max, whatever it is now, um, there's got to be a better way to get their product into the eyes of the people who want to support it, who are curious to, you know, you've got new fans, you've got younger fans, I get it, so you can tell this, 
non I mean, it's still kind of a rated R story for sure, but you know, you don't have the graphic rated R Zack Snyder, hallelujah sex scene in the uh flamethrower going off at the the appropriate moment. You know, I'm I'm willing to admit there there are things in the movie, whether they're a little on the nose or not, that you know, Zack Snyder it will always be Zack Snyder for better or for worse. But but I don't know. And if you're curious about Watchmen at all, it's mildly intriguing, but until chapter two comes out, I think you can probably wait until they do some kind of two film combo. It just really made me want to watch both the beginning of Watchmen again and then watching how they handled Dr. Manhattan. It was interesting what they did as far as kind of piecing together, like, you know, the day, you know, the year is 1964. I am here with Janie. 300 days from now, the accident awaits me. All the, you know, there's different moments, some of that narration. Um, wasn't bad in this animated one. It was interesting to see how they kind of put that together, like you read it in the graphic novel. Uh, and much like in the film live action version, you know, it's like, a, it's a pretty hefty five, six, seven minute sequence as it has to be, I think, to kind of really understand Dr. Manhattan. Um, but again, it just feels like Watchmen light, you know, if you want the abridged version of the story and you don't want like as dark and grisly a tale as they were kind of attending with the original version, then maybe this is for you. But if you are interested in Watchmen and you haven't watched it, I would urge you to go watch the actual live action film because I think it offers more audiences or offers more for audiences uh, just across the board. Uh, now we're going to kind of, you know, just cover a couple quick new streaming films. We've got Furiosa streaming on Max now. So if you have HBO Max, should have just been, they should have just left the HBO. So hard to call it Max. Just doesn't feel right to be like, oh, do you got Max? It's streaming on Max now. It does nothing for me. Furiosa on HBO Max sounds so much better. Uh, I've been dying to watch this movie again. I'm not going to lie. Uh, I haven't watched it yet in the Chrome version, and I'm very tempted to. Still got to show the wife, still got to show a couple people. So I'm toying with which version of that I watch next, but I loved Fury Road that they did in the Chrome edition. Furiosa is just going to look awesome in the same way, I believe. So if you haven't seen it yet, check it out on Max. I mean, you're going to love it. You're going to love it. It is so different, and I think it offers larger audiences more than what Fury Road does. It is far less of just the chase, cars. This is all we're doing. There's so much more depth to the story. Chris Hemsworth's performance is outstanding. Um, Anya Taylor-Joy, though, just incredible how she morphs into Furiosa. Uh, really just definitely a contender. I see too many clips of it on Twitter every week to not be like immediately watching it. Inside Out 2 is now available for digital and rental. The largest grossing movie of the year. What are we, what are we at for Inside Out 2 right now? $1,649,000,000. That's nuts. And it's good. It's pretty good. I'm not going to lie. I feel like I only watched it like a couple months ago. There are far few, fewer memorable moments in this film than there are in the original. I think Inside Out 2 does build upon some of the emotions quite well and kind of takes you into high school and a little bit more of that. But I just feel like across the board, it was lacking what made the first one so special. I think this is one of those Disney sequels that maybe if you'd flushed it out, taken a little more time with it, it would have been a little more impactful and lasting. Obviously... What I say doesn't matter because it's made almost $2 billion. But don't let the money fool you. Inside Out, the original one, far better. Has that air of Pixar. Like there's, I don't know. There are Pixar films now that are fine and fun. Years ago, it would have been like, oh, that's like a pretty good DreamWorks film. Or, you know, like in a Disney original, like, oh, like a Lion King, something like that. You know, it's like, oh, that's kind of fighting the ranks for the Pixar quality. But, you know, once they started doing a ton of sequels and kind of getting a little out there with some of their movies, the Pixar name, I felt, kind of got diminished a little bit. It didn't hold the same weight that it does. It doesn't necessarily hold that weight with me still. Uh, and I love their movies. I love what they do. But I think that, you know, across the board, demanding a little bit more time and a little bit more quality before pumping out. You know, I mentioned it on a podcast 
maybe a few weeks ago. It's like, all right, we're hyping up Frozen 3 and special teaser. Frozen 3 coming out in like 2027, but here's a special teaser. We might do Frozen 4. I don't care about a movie that's going to come out next decade. You know, it just, Disney really needs to rework a lot of their, their priorities, I believe. And Bob Iger, I don't know if he's back on his way out again and they're looking for a replacement, but I think it's time for them to really take a look as we move into Toy Story 5. Uh, You know, it's just the biggest gamble. You know, you can keep doing these, but at some point, it's not going to be as great as you're hoping. And audiences, I think, are kind of catching on where it's like, all right, this was good, but I need that Pixar feel. You guys know what I mean. There's just something that makes a Pixar movie so special so effective and i think that i kind of missed the mark on that a little bit the last film i haven't actually seen this one so i can't speak to the quality of it i can only speak to the fact that a lot of my horror friends have been huge fans of this both for what it does in terms of kind of giving a throwback feel to some of the italian filmmaking and the side it's of you know you've got this monastery these nuns this is a sydney sweeney movie you know i'm sure you've seen the picture of her wearing the nuns outfit um, another neon release, but one that, you know, for me sometimes, again, you know, if there's horror movies, I will go check out more than a few that I'm interested. Sometimes the demonic possession, I like those, but I feel like, you know, the first omen, there's so many of those that I've got to catch up on that I just never really got into maybe. And so that's where it's like, Oh, it's another one of those possession omen movies, whatever. But uh, week after week, I just keep hearing great, great things about immaculate. And it definitely has me curious to watch it. So that's definitely going to be something I'm going to be checking out. But if you've got Hulu, you can stream that on there now. You can also stream Kingdom of the Planet and the Apes on Hulu. So there's definitely a lot to be offered right now out there. Netflix, you've got the director's cuts of Rebel Moon now, which far superior to the originals. But uh, but yeah, this is, you know, this is kind of a bulky. There was lots to discuss this one, but, you know, there's also going to be lots to discuss next episode. So. I'll wrap things up here. Thank you again, as always, for tuning in. You can find us at NT Movie Reviews on all social media networks, podcast platforms, and YouTube. Make it a point to watch something new this week. And even if you don't, let me know what you love to watch. Let me know something that, whether it's horror, I don't know, as summer's kind of winding down, what's one of your go-to films to kind of close out the year? We watched Twisters the other day with some friends on vacation. Huge hit. Glenn Powell, no surprise. Everybody wants some. If you've not seen that movie, unfortunately, you've got to rent it or buy it, but it is well worth it. Glenn Powell, you can watch the genesis of uh, his emergence into the world of film and this takeover that he's on. Thank you again, as always, though, and we'll catch you next time.